Hello everybody and welcome to this video. It's a continuation in the series on William Shakespeare's The Tempest. Today we're going to look at analysing Act 1, Scene 1. Now everything I go through in this video comes from Mr Brust's Guide to The Tempest, which I co-wrote with Kerry Lewis, available for just £3.99 at mrbrough.com and amazon.co.uk. It contains the complete original text, a line-by-line -line translation into modern English, and detailed analysis of language, structure, form, themes, context, etc. So today we're going to have a look at this first scene in the play in terms of analysis. Now, Elizabethan and Jacobean stage sets, for example, the Globe Theatre, as we see here, were barer than today. So Shakespeare employs a range of stage directions to capture the imagination of his audience and create a vivid mental picture of a ship in a storm. Before we even meet the characters, the very first stage direction is a tempestuous noise of thunder and lightning, which immediately attracts the attention of the audience. The storm would have been created with fireworks, thunder sheets, or rolling a cannonball along a wooden trough. The high winds would be replicated by turning a loose piece of canvas on a wheel. Shakespeare's intention from the outset is to draw the audience away from the world of the theatre into the dangers of a storm. Moreover, the numerous entrances and exits in this scene add to the mood of panic, chaos and confusion. The stage direction, Enter Mariners Wet, would have been simple to create by means of a bucket of water, yet it would contribute to the mood of danger. From the outset, Shakespeare intends the opening scene to be an exciting piece of theatre that commands the attention of the audience. The setting of a floundering ship is further established through Shakespeare's use of dialogue. To introduce the setting, the first word in the play is bosun. The audience would know that a bosun is a ship's officer, and this would create a mental image of the action taking place on a ship's deck. The construct of a tempest is used as a device to upset class relationships and create conflict. Structurally, this is significant as this theme is developed throughout the play. The Jacobeans, and prior to that the Elizabethans, believed in the natural order of things, which was defined by God, Everybody was born to a specific class, and they were expected to know their place. Antonio reminds the boatswain of his place when he says this, Where is your master, boatswain? By asking after his master and using his job title, he's implying that the boatswain's not important. And the boatswain might be a symbol for dismissive attitudes at the time towards the lower classes. Antonio uses the possessive pronoun your derived from the formal you instead of thou, which is surprising because it was the custom to use thou when talking to social inferiors. Antonio's and later Sebastian's incorrect use of you reflects the social changes that were taking place at the time, as people were beginning to use you and thou interchangeably. A hundred years after The Tempest was written, you replace thou, uh, the word you replaced thou in most parts of England. And this also symbolises the class boundaries that were being challenged in England, linking to that theme in the play. The boatswain replies, do you not hear him? You mar our labour, keep your cabins, you do assist the storm. The boatswain saying the tempest is the master and the status of the people, uh, sorry, that the tempest is the master and that the status of the people on the ship is unimportant. The declarative, you mar our labour, followed by the imperative, keep your cabins, emphasises the boatswain's attempt to assert control as he tries to save the, chip, the ship. He correctly uses the formal you for addressing the higher status Antonio, but we assume it's said through clenched teeth because he's being hindered from doing his job. Because of the storm, we therefore see that the traditional master-servant roles do not apply. The natural order has been subverted, preparing us for further challenges to authority from Act 1, Scene 2 onwards. Now, Shakespeare employs snappy, fast-paced dialogue with quick exchanges of conversation to create the feeling of panic that is so important here in Act 1, Scene 1. As the scene unfolds, Sebastian swears at the boatswain, saying, A pox on your throat, you ball and blasphemous and charitable dog, while the boatswain defiantly replies, Work you then! The cursing, which is drawn out by adjectives that follow the rule of three, emphasises that Sebastian is attempting to gain control of the situation through his insults. Being higher class, he's used to giving orders, and he attempts to gain it through verbal abuse. Now, in addition, his language implies that he's losing control of himself and panicking. The defiance of the boatswain with his imperative work, you then, confirms to the audience that class roles and relationships are breaking down. 
as well as developing the mood of chaos and confusion, this prepares the audience for Sebastian Anto and Antonio panicking and abandoning ship at the end of the scene. The storm and its ensuing class conflict on the ship might be a metaphor for a similar conflict in England. In 1605, around five years before The Tempest was written, the Catholic Guy Fawkes attempted to blow up the Protestant King James and members of the Houses of Parliament in what became known as the Gunpowder Plot. As well as conflicts between Catholics and Protestants, the poor were taxed heavily, with much of the money funding the king's expensive masks, and over time the division between the rich and the poor grew wider, culminating in the start of the English Civil War in 1642, 31 years after The Tempest was first performed, and in 1649 the beheading of King Charles I, the son of King James I. Choosing Italian characters to illustrate the contemporary theme of class conflict was an effective way of examining class relations without directly insulting or offending members of the English aristocracy. That's something we see in the poem Ozymandias and a lot of literature. If you want to criticise what's going on in society, set your text somewhere else so it's not so obvious. The Tempest itself, then, the storm, might also be a metaphor for other conflicts in the play, for example the conflict between the colonisers and the colonised with Prospero and Caliban, and as we've seen there are emotional tempests between members of families. We'll also be introduced to the emotional tempest of the forbidden love between Ferdinand and Miranda, and generational conflict when Miranda disobeys Prospero's orders by telling Ferdinand her name. Shakespeare uses the characters as devices to introduce emerging themes. For example, he develops the theme of the power of nature when the boatswain personifies the waves and uses imperatives. He tells the courtiers, hence, what cares these roarers for the name of the king? To cabin, silence, trouble us not. Imperatives dominate as he tells the courtiers to get out of his way, disrupting the natural order of class relationships. The personification of Rorus emphasises that the king is powerless against nature, heightening his vulnerability as well as the vulnerability of those on board the ship. After emerging um, from, sorry, another emerging theme is challenging those in power. The character of Antonio, who usurped Prospero, embodies the idea that it is possible to gain power illegally. Their lack of loyalty to the king is introduced in this scene when they put their own safety first and abandon the king on the sinking ship instead of turning to God and praying to be forgiven for their sins. This behaviour would have been shocking to a contemporary audience who believed that as part of the natural order the king was God's representative on earth. And by abandoning King Alonso, Sebastian and Antonio are in essence abandoning God. This is emphasised when they choose not to pray. Their characters are therefore established in this scene, and this prepares the audience for Sebastian and Antonio's later plotting and attempted regicide. What else? Well, in this scene, the audience meets the optimistic old councillor Gonzalo, who serves as a foil to Sebastian and Antonio. Instead of creating class conflict, Gonzalo attempts to preserve the natural order when he tells the boatswain, Remember whom thou hast aboard, in other words, the king. He correctly uses thou because he's a high status character addressing the lower class boatswain. Gonzalo's use of thou and references to the king are an attempt to remind the boatswain of his place. Unlike Sebastian, he does not swear and curse, which emphasises the difference between them. Another contrast is when Gonzalo wishes to assist the king and prince at prayers, illustrating his goodness. And this knowledge prepares us for Prospero's later revelation that his and Miranda's survival was due to Gonzalo secretly supplying their boat with provisions. Shakespeare also introduces the theme of repentance and forgiveness in this scene when Gonzalo reports the killing and prince, uh, sorry, the king and prince at prayers. This illustrates that the king is willing to repent and ask God for forgiveness for his sins, so we can conclude that at heart the king is a good man. And this foreshadows the king's repentance in the climax of the play when he realises the enormity of his crimes against Prospero. The king and prince who pray together clearly hold similar values. By including this information at this moment in the play, Shakespeare helps the audience to understand the king's great distress when he later believes that Ferdinand has drowned in the storm. And Shakespeare deliberately draws the attention of the audience to the role of religion in society when Gonzalo, as a good Christian, accepts the fate that God has willed. The wills above be done, he says. 
This phrase reminds us of the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And by accepting the will of God, Gonzalo is confirming that earthly rule, i.e. the king, has no control over the power of God. These are the final words of the scene, and by placing them here, Shakespeare emphasises the importance of religion in contemporary society. However, Gonzalo's thoughts are ironic because he's unaware that Prospero, not God, is responsible for the storm. I hope you found this video useful. Please do go and pick up a guide of the Tempest, a copy of the Tempest Study Guide, and subscribe to the channel.